to understand in your Bible. Again, I appreciate you tuning in, and I hope that the Bible study today will be a blessing to you. I hope that it will be information that you can use in your life day by day. And I hope that it also will be information that will help you to know how to understand your Bible. As I mentioned quite frequently on the broadcast, uh, a lot of people have the idea that the Bible is real hard to be understood. That's one of the reasons there's so many translations on the market today. But you know, the Bible is not really hard to be understood if we follow certain principles that God himself has laid out in his word. Uh, the Bible says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now it's obvious that if the scripture is God's means for doing all of those things, he would not leave it where it was so complicated that we could not understand it. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So our purpose in this broadcast is to show you how to rightly divide the word of truth so that you can understand uh, the Bible more clearly. Uh, we have a chart that we use in demonstrating this, and what we've done in the chart is simply break the Bible down into divisions as God has divided it. That is, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has to do with the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. During that time, Jesus Christ taught the gospel of the kingdom. He called out 12 men, taught them to preach that gospel. He said he was sent to Israel, and he said during that period of time that the law of Moses was to be observed. In the early part of Acts, that ministry is carried out by the twelve. But in Acts 9, the Apostle Paul is saved. And the next 13 books in your Bible are Romans through Philemon. I've always found it interesting that even though Peter was the primary uh, uh, man mentioned, the primary disciple over here in the early part of Acts, once Paul is saved, there's very little mention. Only one chapter after Acts chapter 9 is Peter even mentioned. After that, all the emphasis turns to Paul, and the next 13 books in your Bible are Paul's epistles. So the teachings of Christ today we find in Romans through Philemon through the message given to Paul. Then the book of Hebrews through Revelation, that doctor will match the doctor of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but it deals primarily with the tribulation and millennial reign. Now, one of the primary purposes and primary reasons for rightly dividing the word of truth is that we might preach and teach the right gospel. And we've talked about that every, every uh, Bible study. We try to close out the study with a presentation of the gospel because the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Today, I want to talk with you about something a little bit different because many times uh, people get the misunderstanding that, that we that preach salvation by grace through faith without any works, without any deeds of the law, without water baptism, without joining the church, people get the idea that we do not believe that we should do good works and that we believe people should just live any way they want to and uh, that kind of thing. But I want you to notice a couple of passages. And uh, what I want to talk to you about today is, is good works, are they required or desired? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Paul says there, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest it by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says that there, we're all in a race, and he says that we need to run that race so that we might obtain a crown. Not a corruptible crown, but an incorruptible. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. You see, when we begin to talk about works, and we begin to talk about salvation by grace, it is very important that we keep in mind the truth of salvation by grace. We do disservice to the Word of God if we mix the information concerning rewards with the truth of salvation by grace. And while some people look at this as a conflict 
between these two truths. That's not the case. It's necessary to keep each truth in its proper context to bring harmony to the two doctrines of works as a result of being saved, not works in order to be saved. You see, there is no truth that is more clearly presented in God's Word, uh, particularly in Paul's epistles, the doctrine for the church, than salvation by grace through faith. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, one of our favorite verses, Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, it couldn't be any clearer. He says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is God's unmerited favor. That is, there is nothing that we could ever do to earn salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and it not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So the, the, the doctrine is clear. Salvation is by grace through faith. It's not by being baptized. It's not by joining the church. It's not by confessing our sins or turning away from our sins, even though we should turn away from our sins. Salvation has to do completely and totally with what we believe. What do we have to believe? We have to believe the gospel that was preached by the Apostle Paul. That gospel is Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised again the third day according to the Scriptures. Paul said that gospel is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. He said that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses. And so in Romans chapter 11 verse 6, He said if by grace it is no more of works. Think about that. If by grace it is no more of works. There was a time when works were involved in salvation, as in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When the man came to Jesus, he said, Good Master, what must I do to have eternal life? He said, Keep the commandments. But Paul says in Romans chapter 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Uh, Romans chapter 4 verse 4 says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 9 tells us why that God will not save a person on the basis of his work. He says, Lest any man should boast. In other words, the idea there is if man had anything to do with his salvation, if he had to join the church or get baptized or anything in the flesh, keep the law, whatever it might be, he said it's not of works lest any man should boast. Well, why is it God will not allow salvation by works? Because in verse 6 of Ephesians 2, it says, He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So it's clear that these verses that we've just read demonstrate without a doubt that works are not the basis of salvation. Uh, and there are many other verses in Paul's epistles uh, that, that indicate and point out clearly that uh, works have nothing to do with our salvation. Salvation is by grace through faith. But in Ephesians chapter 2, we stop there in verse 9, but notice, he says in verse 8 again, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, the reason that so many people today preach works as a means of salvation is because they confuse the doctrine of rewards on the basis of works, not salvation. Salvation is a free gift. But there are numerous verses in the Bible that also demonstrate that works after salvation are of the utmost importance. Let me read a couple of those. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 12. The Bible says, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, 
For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Notice that a man could lose all reward that is associated with his work and still be saved. He said, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet as by, so as by fire. So the Bible is clear to distinguish, particularly in Paul's epistles, between works as a means of salvation and works as a result of salvation. In Romans chapter 14, again the Apostle Paul makes reference to uh, this judgment of believers. In Romans chapter 14, in verse 10, he says, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Notice now, So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. As we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Romans 14, and also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul says in verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, uh, what we have to do in studying the Scriptures and looking at the Scriptures is to recognize the distinction between the free gift of salvation and the rewards for service uh, that are pointed out by the Apostle Paul. And there is a difference. For example, let me, let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul makes it clear that as believers we have a sanctified position in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice the next verses. And such were some of you. And he does not say, but you repented of these things and turned over a new leaf. No, he says, such were some of you, but you are washed, but you are sanctified, but you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You see, as believers, we have a sanctified position in Christ that was totally dependent upon what Christ did. In Christ, we are washed, we are sanctified, and we are justified. However, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, in verse 3, he said, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Now, pay attention to this. It's very important. On the one hand, as believers, we have a sanctified position in Christ. However, in service to the Lord and for the Lord, we are to abstain from sin in order to be sanctified for God's purpose while we're here in this flesh. One has to do with a spiritual sanctification. Another one is the one we bring about as a result of setting ourselves aside, that's what sanctified means, for God's service on the basis of the fact that we recognize we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Uh, another point. As believers, we have a position of absolute acceptance in Christ. Notice in Ephesians chapter 1, in verse 6, the Bible says, uh, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the beloved. You see, the wonderful truth of that verse is that we are not working in order to be accepted of God. Most religions, uh, probably the majority of religions in the world, teach that people are working in order to be accepted of God. Why? Because they are ignorant of God's righteousness. Righteousness. 
That was the problem with the nation Israel uh, in the beginning of the dispensation of grace as Paul preached to them in Romans chapter 10. He mentions there that uh, the people, the nation Israel, were ignorant of God's righteousness. He says in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. You see, the wonderful truth of Ephesians 1, 6 is, is that we didn't become accepted by anything we did in the flesh. As a matter of fact, Ephesians chapter uh, 4 says, or, yeah, Ephesians chapter 4 says that God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. He said in Ephesians 4.32, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. So He's made us accepted in the blood. However, in our daily walk, we want to live in a manner that our works would also be acceptable. In Romans chapter 14, in verse 17, the Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Now in the one place we read where we've been accepted in the blood. Here he said that we might, that we might be acceptable to God, to God and approved of men. You see, on the one hand we're accepted spiritually, but on the other hand our work is to be accepted, it's to be a, a work that would be acceptable to God Almighty. And by the way, when Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, he tells us how our work can be acceptable. He said, Stirred to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In other words, our work needs to be work that is approved of God, not just what our church tells us to do, not what our denominational system, the tradition of men tells us to do. We need to be sure our work is in accordance with the Scriptures and it's acceptable to God and it's approved of God and we do that by rightly dividing the word of truth. So we have a sanctified position in Christ and yet we are to live a sanctified life. We're accepted in Christ, and yet in our daily lives we seek that our service be acceptable to God. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, as believers, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 2, as believers, and we read this a moment ago, uh, we have a position in the heavenlies seated at the right hand of God. He said in Ephesians 2, 5, Even when we were dead in sins, He hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. So as believers, we have a position in the heavenlies seated at the right hand of the Father. However, in our walk on this earth, we are still subject to all the trials and tribulations that everybody else is. You see, God has not delivered us in the flesh from this present evil world. So in Romans chapter 8, in verse 22, the Apostle Paul says... For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. So while on the one hand, spiritually speaking, we're seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, we are also in the flesh... We remain here and we uh, suffer all the, the, the things of this earth that other people suffer. Christian people have not been delivered from the heartaches and the hurts of living in a sin-cursed earth. And so we need to be cognizant of the fact, we need to keep in the very forefront of our mind that even though our salvation is by grace, through faith, there's going to come a time when every person, every saved individual is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said the work is going to be judged on the basis of what sort it is. Uh, let's look over there again because this is very important. You see, 
the religious world and the world in general generally thinks in the sense of bigger is better. And they look at the quantity of what's produced. And they look at the churches that have the big buildings and are successful. Well, Paul says that that, that, is, that is wrong because he said that is supposing that gain is godliness. Gain is not necessarily godliness. Some of the fastest growing religions in the world are false religions. They are false teachers. Uh, and so we don't judge our work on the basis of how much it is. And neither does God. As a matter of fact, he says there in verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 3, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. You see, as sons of God, we as believers have a position in Christ as the sons of God, and so we're to act upon that which we are in Christ. We're to live like who we've been made. We've been made sons of God. We've been adopted into the family of God. And so when Paul was writing to the Romans and he was explaining to them about salvation by grace through faith, he was confronted with exactly this same issue. Uh, in Romans chapter 5, he said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. What a glorious truth. What a wonderful truth. And he talks about all through Romans chapter 5, this position that we have of righteousness. In Adam we were all sinners. In Christ we've been made righteous. He talks about in Romans 5, 17, the gift of righteousness is ours. And then in Romans chapter 6, Paul addresses something that people today still have a problem with. Because I can tell you, after preaching salvation by grace for some 22 years, that most of the time, the general response is, is that if you preach, teach people salvation by grace, then people are going to live any way they want to. Well, you know something, folks? The truth is that people are going to live any way they want to anyway. And the fact is that salvation is by grace through faith, and we cannot control people and make them do what they want to. It is our job as ministers of the gospel to simply present to them the truth of how they can be saved and then what they should do as a result of that. So the, the issue at Rome was the same issue we face today. What was that? Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, you know what Paul's response was to that? He said, God forbid. God forbid that we should believe that because we're saved by grace, we now can live any way we want to without any consequence in our life. Why, the Bible is clear that whatever we sow, we're going to reap. He said, if we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. And so there is a tremendous importance in what we do as saved individuals, not only in this life, but in the life to come, because there's going to come a day when we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and all of our work is going to be tried of what sort it is. Paul says here in Romans chapter 6, in verse 13, or verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace." Why, the very people that ought to live uh, the most godly lives in the world are the people that realize that they are saved by grace through faith. Being saved by grace does not give us the opportunity to sit down and do nothing. Being saved by grace gives us the responsibility of responding to that message of who we are in Christ and acting upon that. And he said, Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? Again, he said, God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Notice how they overcame that. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Salvation is by grace through faith. 
You want to be saved? Trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Believe in the gospel. If you're already saved, realize that there is a body of truth. Paul calls it that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. You want to live a godly life? You want to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and a life that will bring a reward at the judgment seat of Christ? Then your life needs to be based upon the truth that Jesus Christ gave to us through the Apostle Paul that we find in Romans through Philemon. That's why we're to rightly divide the word of truth. This is not just some kind of hobby horse. This is important because God told us to do it. And if we don't rightly divide the word of truth and we don't preach church doctrine, then people are going to be confused and they're going to lose their reward and their, reward, their, their, their work is not going to be acceptable to God Almighty. Study. Study. Read this book. Why? To show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It is important how we live after we're saved. We are saved by grace through faith, but we are told to live because in a manner that's pleasing to Him, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good work. Grace Bible Church extends to you and your family a cordial invitation to join us for our Sunday services. Bible classes begin at 10 a.m. with morning service at 11 and informal evening Bible study at 6 p.m. For more information, phone 847-0768. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Understanding Your Bible. For more information, write to the address on your screen or call 423-847-0768. Be sure to be with us again next week for another edition of Understanding Your Bible.